ಭಗವಂತೂರಾತ್ಮೇತಿಭಾಗಿಣೇಮೂರ್ತಿಭೇದವಿಭಾಗಿಣೇಮವ್ಯಾಪ್ತೇಹಾಯ ದಕ್ಷಿಣಾಮೂರ್ತ ನಮಃ ಸದಾಶಿವ ಸಾರಂಭ ಶಂಕರಾಚಾರ್ಯ ಮಧ್ಯಮ ಅಸ್ಮದಾಚಾರ್ಯ ಪರ್ಯಂತ ವಂದೇ ಗುರು ಪರಂಪರಾಹನಾವತು ಸಹ ನೌಧುನಕ್ತು ಸಹ ವೀರ್ಯೌ ಕರವಾವಹೈ ತೇಜಸ್ವಿನಾವಧೀತಮಸ್ತು ಮಾ ಪೃಥ್ವಿಷಾವಹೈ so last week uh, we we began to see how the bhagavad gita is a pramanam having understood now what pramanam is and the importance of pramanam we saw how bhagavad gita is a pramanam and then we saw the meaning the high level meaning of the word bhagavan so aishwaryam veeryam yashas fame shri resources uh vairagyam dispassion and jnanam knowledge full measure of all these six attributes we saw that <clears throat> so what does the word bhagavad gita mean even though this this series of classes is not about bhagavad gita we want to list the you know, vedas important to know what they are bhagavad gita is a very important scripture important shastram uh, in the life of an indian so we want to understand that also so this gita the word gita is a popular name which is used in our shastram to refer to any shastram also so there is uddhava gita there is rama gita there is there is kama gita there is ganesha gita so like this there are many gitas and of which this bhagavad gita is probably we can say the most popular so what is this what is this uh, gita gita means song and or gita it is called gita because it is pleasing it is pleasing so why the bhagavad gita is pleasing if we ask we can say that <clears throat> it is in the form of a song it's not a prose <coughs> composition it is a metrical composition it is in the form of uh, two meters called an anushtup chanda and trishtup chanda so it can be sung asochanam asochastvam ಪ್ರಜ್ಞಾಶಸೆ ಗತಾಸು ನ ಗತಾಸು ನಾನು ಸೋಚಂತಿ ಪಂಡಿತ ಸೊ ಲೈಕ್ ದಟ್ ಸೊ ಇಟ್ಸ್ ಪ್ಲೀಸಿಂಗ್ ಟು ಹಿಯರ್ ದಿಸ್ ಇಸ್ ಅನುಷ್ಟು ಛಂದ ವಾಸಿ ಜೀರ್ಣ ವಿಹಾಯ ನ ವಾ ನಿಗೃಹಾತಿ ನೋಪರಾಣಿ ತೀರಾ ವಿಹಾಯ ಜೀರ್ಣ 
anyani sanyati navani dehi so this is the other form other metrical form that you have in bhagavad gita called trishtuk chanda so these are the only two meters so it's pleasing to hear therefore it is called gita but that cannot be enough because uh, we can all give a list of thousand hindi songs which are pleasing to hear telugu songs i i remember those days when i was in college when there was no internet and computer i used to write down all the songs i knew one after the other and i used to write who was the music director which movie it was who sang the songs i don't believe it i could i wrote pages and pages and pages so i was so passionate about listening to these songs so we could do that that's this that's also pleasing <clears throat> so here the more important point is the subject matter what the song talks about is the is the is the point and it says so many good things about me all our life we hear all kinds of stuff about us you know you know you idiot paithyam you know all these words we have heard hindi i'm sure there are some other words also uh are you mad they will say so all these things we have heard nobody says oh you are the best nobody says you are the whole nobody says you are complete like this nobody says and this bhagavad gita comes and tells us all these things so it's pleasing to hear even if i may not understand it it's pleasing to hear so therefore gita <coughs> and the topic of the bhagavad gita is is myself is the jiva and so two ways of interpreting bhagavad gita one is a gita whose topic is bhagavan right a gita a song whose topic is bhagavan that will be called bhagavad gita or more popularly if you find you find textbooks which say the lord's song bhagavan's gita the song that is sung by bhagavan because vyasa is presenting bhagavan or krishna as bhagavan so bhagavan song so two ways of looking at bhagavad gita <clears throat> so the our more Our, our interest lies in this fact that the topic of bhagavad gita is bhagavan <clears throat> so we ask these questions about who am i what is atma what is this jiva what is bhagavan what is this world who created this world or was the world always there what is the relationship between me and this ishwara this bhagavan is bhagavan here or he is he is created it and gone he is having fun somewhere else what is the deal with all this so these are the questions that we ask <coughs> and so this becomes the gita whose topic is bhagavan is bhagavad gita and so what does it contain so we alluded to this earlier karma yoga and jnana yoga there are other words they use bhakti yoga etc but broadly categorized into karma yoga and jnana yoga <coughs> jnana yoga means this this answering these questions understanding the siddhantam understanding the explanations given by shri krishna and using the upanishads that is jnana yoga exclusive pursuit of the study of our shastram we can say is jnana yoga 
but then that exclusive pursuit in order to make that happen there is something called karma yoga karma yoga is needed so for to prepare ourselves for jnana yoga so karma yoga means leading a life of dharma doing our duties in the ashrama that we are in whether it is brahmachari ashrama or grahastha ashrama and doing all our duties with the attitude with the attitude that i see ishwara in everything i see bhagwan in everything i do so prasada buddhi prasada buddhi means whatever comes i take it as prasada the word prasada is interesting because i am certain that every indian language has the word prasad hindi mein prasad bolte hain telugu mein prasadam bolte hain tamil mein prasadam like this in other languages i am certain the word prasad has to be there without the word prasad the indian language is incomplete so prasad buddhi is so important and then there is something called ishwar arpana buddhi so what comes what comes to me i take as prasada an attitude what i do what about what i do what i do i do with ishwar arpana buddhi means i offer it you know when we go to the temple we offer whatever we give we offer when we do puja at home we offer we offer naivedya so that attitude of offering when we take care of our children we offer we don't expect something in return from them so offering that attitude so these two attitudes if you will ishwararpana buddhi and prasad buddhi constitutes karma yoga <clears throat> so we will have a chance to study more uh this this uh these two topics because this is a this is a very big topic within the bhagavad gita and because we all need that karma yoga we all need the preparation the bhagavad gita spends a lot of time on that and as i said jnana yoga also called brahma vidya is asking the questions about atma jiva brahma etc there is a sentence which says geeta sugeeta kartavya किम शास्त्र विस्तर सो समी हेज रिटन दिस वेन द भगवदगीता इज देर वै डू यू नीड ऑल द अदर शास्त्र वै डू यू नीड टू स्टडी एनीथिंग एल्स वेन भगवदगीता इज देर सो लाइक दैट दे हेव प्रेज द भगवदगीता सो ऑफन वेन आई वॉज यंग आई रिमेम्बर वेन आई वॉज रीडिंग अबउट महात्मा गांधी एंड ऑल somewhere i read mahatma gandhi used to read the bhagavad gita and you know as a child we don't understand what that means we think oh there is it's something important so all arbindo all our freedom fighters they all used to study the bhagavad gita they used to they used to be scholars knowledgeable about the shastra so it must be a big source of inspiration even for those people 
who inspire us they also des- des- needed some inspiration and that bhagavad gita provided that inspiration so that's how important the bhagavad gita is and and sometimes it is said that don't read the bhagavad gita or any upanishad yourself it is often said that said like that because of the subject matter that is involved which has to be carefully handled otherwise there is a big risk of interpreting the words in a way that is not in keeping with the shastram because we can interpret things only based on the knowledge we have and since there is a huge paradigm shift that is happening whenever there is a paradigm shift then we need the help of somebody else to take us from this paradigm to another paradigm to take us from one level of thinking to another level of thinking i think uh, i remember a statement from einstein uh a problem cannot be solved by the same system that created the problem something like that i don't remember the exact sentence but so that's the idea here that we need the help of somebody to to communicate to us the message of the bhagavad gita and and adi shankara wrote a big commentary on the bhagavad gita the bhagavad gita itself is big and adi shankaracharya wrote this commentary and he says there he says why he writes a commentary he says already there are many people who have written about the bhagavad gita see those days you had to justify you have to justify why you are writing something can't simply write because i feel like writing that is not acceptable why are you writing this book so he says very clearly in introduction he gives he says because there are many different views of the bhagavad gita and those views are contradictory i want to clarify many points which need clarification and therefore i am writing a brief commentary he uses the word brief so it's very clear from that that we need some external help somebody to hold our hands while we study the bhagavad gita and so the shastram talks about the need for a teacher in fact a teacher is not the right word a need for a guru and shankara does use the word durvigneyam durvigneyam means difficult to understand he says that and why it is difficult to understand we can talk about if somebody comes and says mathematics is difficult algebra is difficult what will you tell him will a teacher excuse a student when the student comes and says teacher math is difficult i may be excused from studying mathematics is that acceptable a good teacher will never accept that a good teacher will say tell me boy what is it what is the problem why do you say it's difficult so the teacher he or she will try to find out what is it that's blocking that is obstructing this child from appreciating the beauty of mathematics correct so a physicist 
will not simply excuse somebody and says, no, this is too much. I can't, I can't handle physics. No, a good teacher will not do that. Many teachers will blame students. Oh, he's no good, she's no good, and things like that. But a teacher who is committed to teaching <coughs> will not, will never ever accept that. Will take the blame on herself or himself. I have not been able to communicate this message to this child. I have not been able to understand what is the, the child's problem. That is how the teacher will think. So, okay, Shankara uses the word durvignayam, difficult to, to, to follow, to understand. One reason. Second reason for a guru. The topic being such, the words can be cryptic, cryptically mentioned. So it is the job of a teacher to unlock the meaning of those words. And that has to be done somewhat carefully. And third reason can be, well, even in the Bhagavad Gita, Arjuna asked for it. Shishyasteham. He said, I am your student. Shadi maam tvam prapannam. Please teach me. I am your teacher. Shishya, beautiful Sanskrit word, which means Shashana Yogya. I am capable of being taught. So the one who is the one who is capable of being taught is a Shishya. That is the literal meaning of the word Shishya. See how how these words reveal itself when we start studying Sanskrit a little bit. So Arjuna says that. And Krishna is teaching. And Arjuna is constantly asking questions. Every chapter, almost every chapter begins with a question of Arjuna. So therefore, surely if Arjuna had doubts, we will also have doubts and we need some help. <clears throat> and another reason is also given. That even words may not be enough to reveal the subject matter. And, and, and we can elaborate on that at a later time. Sometimes they say, Dakshana Murti Shiva taught his students without speaking a single word. How can words reveal? You have to reveal this knowledge through silence. Like that, some people say. But that's not the point. If words, if a good teacher cannot teach a particular subject, how can silence reveal the subject? It's not possible. So we don't get into that kind of esoteric discussion. Mystical kind of thing. There is no mysticism in this. So some of these factors are mentioned to highlight the fact that a, a person who has assimilated the subject, who has appreciated completely this statement, this Mahavakya, is needed to, to help others see this, understand this subject. So there is a, there is a popular uh, shloka. Which, uh, which many of you will know. Gukarastu andhakaro vai rukarastu tat nivartakaha. Like that it says. So this sloka tells what the word guru means. It says, it literally says, in the word guru, the letter gu refers to darkness, andhakara, gukarastu andhakara, rukarastan nivartakaha. The letter ru, on the other hand, in this word guru, refers to the removal of. And since 
ignorance, which is represented by darkness, can only be removed by knowledge, which is represented by light. A popular metaphor in our Shastra. And since the Guru does that, since this person uses knowledge to remove that ignorance, that person is called a Guru. Like that, this, shows, this uh, shloka talks. So we all used to chant it in all our uh, classes like this. Gukarastu andhakaro vai Gukarastan nivartakaraha Andhakara nirodhitvat Gururiti abhidhiyate Like that it goes. So how does this person, how does this guru unfold the subject matter? Very interesting, the way they explain it. <clears throat> you see, the Mahavakyam is stated, you are that Aham Brahmasmi. All this is stated. It's not like a cave where you have to go inside and then find out what is there at the end of the tunnel. No. What is there at the end of the tunnel is already shown to us. Tattva Masi. You are that. So the fact is there out there. But yet I cannot see the fact. So they say, the process of unfolding this fact is like a sculptor sculpting an, an idol, a sculpture. So all our murtis are all sculpted from a single piece of stone. They don't, uh, they don't bring a leg, two legs separately done, then the waist and then head, hands, they don't build, build it like that. No murti is done like that. Every murti is done by this cult called Sthapati. The Sthapati builds this. Now tell me, is he constructing this murti? One will say, no, the murti is already there. It is already there. So this murti, this, this Sthapati, Chisels away, chisels away the parts that blocks us from seeing the murti. Isn't it? The murti is there right in front of us. But I see a piece of stone. So help me see the murti. Help me see Shiva here in the stone. Help me see Devi in the stone. Yes, this is the In fact, I was very moved when I heard that these tapatis, they have to meditate on this murti. There are dhyana shlokas. There are dhyana mantras for each murti that is going to be created. And they have to visualize this murti. Obviously, because without Without already seeing it, where is the question of this tapati creating the murti? They have to see it first and then they have to make it come alive. And so, since then, my, my, my respect for these tapatis increased dramatically because they are not simply some kind of artists. Even, a, even an artist deserves so much admiration from us. You know, sometimes you go around to places and there are people sitting on the street, street sidewalk, and they will be drawing your picture. He looks at you, he draws. He looks at you, he draws. He sketches, he sketches, and then he shows it to you. And then you're amazed. And then you pay him some money and get that sketch. So even that is amazing. 
Just imagine the job the Satati does. So this Guru is like that. They say the Guru unfolds the topic which is already out there and that topic is made alive. And so I like this metaphor very much. The metaphor of a Stapati, of a sculptor. So then, then how did, how did this Guru come to be? Then they say, well, the Guru was taught by his Guru. That Guru was taught by her Guru. That Guru was taught by his Guru. So like this, the lineage goes. And so the question can arise sometimes. Who was the first Guru? Who is the first Guru? So, so if we ask, okay, I had parents. My parents were born. They had parents. And they also had parents, etc. Who was the first father? Who was the first mother? Maybe a tough question to ask. Tough question to answer. Because it's hard to trace back all the way. So you can talk about evolution and things like that. But in this case we say it has to be Ishvara. It has to be Parameshvara. Because the minute you stop somewhere and say he or she is my first guru our first guru, if you say, then we will ask the question, what about the guru of that guru? So we attribute all to Ishvara, the all pervasive Ishvara. That Ishvara is the first guru. And so often we attribute to Shiva this role of a teacher. So when the role of a teacher is given to Shiva, then we look at Shiva and don't call him Shiva anymore. We call him Dakshinamurti. Dakshinamurti is the name of Shiva when Shiva takes on the role of a teacher. That's the idea. So who is the first guru means we generally say either Shiva or Dakshinamurti. Saraswati also comes to mind. We say Saraswati is the goddess of learning. <clears throat> so Vidya Devi, we say. So she is the embodiment of knowledge. Any piece of knowledge means Saraswati is residing there. That is Saraswati Sakshat. So she is given the, she is the presiding deity of knowledge. So we don't consider, when we talk about teaching, then we look up to Shiva, we look up to Dakshinamurti. So this Guru Shishya Parampara becomes important because, you know, there is that, there is that flow of knowledge. And so, we start this class also, if you remember, if you recall, Sadashiva Samarambham Shankaracharya Madhyamam Asmadacharya Paryantam Vande Guru Paramparam. So, we salute the Guru Parampara because the knowledge is so important that it has been, it must have been preserved all these centuries and millennia and who knows how long. And so, we, we worship this parampara. Sadashiva Samarambham. This parampara which was started by Sadashiva. Shankaracharya Madhyamam. Which was very effectively captured by Adi Shankaracharya. At a time where people were confused. He consolidated all the Shastram 
Upanishads, Bhagavad Gita. He wrote commentaries on them. And he wrote many more of his own stotras, like Dakshinamurti Stotram. Shankaracharya Madhyama, Asmad Acharya Paryantam. This lineage until my own teacher, my own guru. Asmad Acharya means my teacher. One day Guru Parampara. So that Guru Parampara, I salute. My Namaskar to that Parampara. <coughs> So then, uh, how do I find a guru? Yes, now I am very interested. I got very inspired. I know a little bit now about the Vedas, Vedanta, Bhagavad Gita. So how do I find a guru? So this question can arise. Nothing wrong with that. <clears throat> and here, uh, our Swamiji would joke. He will say, yes. Look for a person who is wearing a particular type of dress. So maybe an orange dress. In India, we have a lot of respect for this ochre robe. And also look for a person with a long beard. A flowing white long beard would be very useful to have. Would be very nice to have. Look for that person. So will that person be my guru? And uh, obviously, that cannot be the answer. One who, now that we have understood some Vedanta, we talked about this man looking for his glasses. The person who already has glasses is looking for glasses. That's the crux of Vedanta, the topic of Vedanta anyway. So a person who looks at the problem, the fundamental problem of the human being as an error, a person who looks at the fundamental problem as an error, error means a seeking born of an erroneous conclusion. That person can be a teacher. Of Vedanta. Just think about that. If the person looks at the problem as something different than that, if the person says, You are the problem, I am the solution. Look at that. You are the problem, I am the solution. Means you have to rely on me. Means what? Means the approach is entirely different. Yes, you have a problem. Yes, I know you're suffering. Yes, you have to solve it. But I am the solution to your problem. So if that is the approach, then the, the, the whole approach is different. The outcome is different. The types of Advice given will be different and the whole relationship will be different. And the potential to manipulate also will enter into the game. So we need to be alert to that. And if a person says, yes, you are the problem, but you are the solution. You are the problem. You are the solution to that problem, if they say, then there is a lot of room for objectivity. The person can be objective and the person can communicate to the, to the student that objectivity is so important in this. We can't get lost. We can't afford to get lost in emotions and fancy words and fancy Imaginations. Imaginations are okay, but can't get too lost in that. And so that person can bring us back to ourselves. 
because if the problem is real think about it if the problem is real if the problem of my suffering is real then nobody can remove that problem nobody can remove that problem it has to be as though real it has to be something that i have taken to be real and the word real also is inadequate here but we are constrained to use that word because we don't have other words in english if the problem is satyam then there is no solution there cannot be a solution the problem has to be as though real there is a beautiful word in sanskrit for an as though real problem that word is mithya the word is mithya so the problem if it is mithya then i can see the possibility of that problem being mithya and that seeing itself is the solution to this problem so this is the meaning of saying you are the problem you are the solution it is not some you know fancy words very poetic way of saying it no it's not like that we don't get into too much poetry in vedanta poetry is good in its own way but poetry requires a lot of imagination and vedanta reduces all our imagination means it it neutralizes all these funny things ideas we have and it brings us back to ground level that is vedanta so even if there is a line that looks like a poem we have to and if if they say it is shastram we have to understand that line that line of so called poetry and interpret it and make some sense out of it so who is a guru then a guru is one who looks at this human predicament who look at this looks at this problem as an error a problem born of an erroneous conclusion okay this is what we said number 1 number 2 guru is one who looks at this problem as not a personal problem or a personal error but it's a universal error universal referring to every being every self conscious being on this planet or anywhere else in this universe let there might be self conscious beings beings not different not enough self conscious beings because no cow comes and tells us i have a problem please help me if there is a problem that needs help the ability to express that problem must be given to me and apparently these animals we don't see those kinds of we don't see those kinds of manifestations we don't see that kind of a cow or a dog in fact a couple of days ago i was looking at a subhashitam in sanskrit it says try to recall now it says eko ham i am alone asahayo ham i am somebody who cannot be helped and i need help i am lonely these thoughts these thoughts a lion cannot even have in its dream like that 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 shloka is telling us a lion in it, even in its dream cannot have these kinds of thoughts it seems so this wonderful human being has these kinds of thoughts right i am persecuted i am prosecuted i am vulnerable i am i'm suffering so all these ideas so that's that cannot be a personal problem it has to be a universal problem and because it is a universal problem the bhagavad gita 
the Upanishads, etc., can be called as a scripture, Shastram. I don't like to use the word scripture because it's an English word referring to something different. So it's called Shastram. What is Shastram now? We say Shastram is that that applies, that has to apply universally. It, therefore, it can't talk about a topical problem. It can't talk about, hey, there is water shortage in Coimbatore. How to solve that problem? It's a topical problem. It's something that the human mind has the ability to figure out itself. Shastram doesn't have to step in. It has to talk about a problem that's universal and that only the Shastram can solve. So, so, so that's where the need for a Guru arises to solve a problem which is based up on an erroneous conclusion and one who accepts this problem as a universal problem. And therefore, the Shastram also says, Guru Mevabi Gachet. Upanishad says that. It says that. It says in, uh, I think it's uh, Mandukya Upanishad. Very beautiful. I like this, this mantra very much. It says, after a person examines one's life, so I have examined my life, I have led a life of ups and downs, I have been through this and that, I have accomplished so many things, I have failed in so many things, and now I am scratching my head, and I am thinking, when is this going to end? Or is this going to end? What is, I am running after so called success. Let me, let me first find out what success is before running after success. What is it that I am after really in this life? So like this, if one starts thinking, so the mantra says, Pariksha Lokan Karma Chitan. Pariksha, after having examined what Lokan, Lokan means one's life. One's life of so many activities, so many things that we have been seeking all life. So, Pariksha Lokan Karma Chitan Nirveda Mayad. Nirveda Mayad means this person having examined one's life has become somewhat wiser. Has become wiser. How, how he has become, he or she has become wiser. Nasti Akritaha Kritena. If I am the uncreated one, and I am to be discovered, then that discovery cannot happen by an action. No action can take me to this wholeness that I am seeking. No action can make finite into infinite. Anybody who has gone to school and college can accept that statement. Finite can never become infinite. Unless you divide it by zero. And even that we don't fully understand. This infinite is not an easy thing to understand, right? So we used to simply write the symbol, infinite symbol. And all our calculators used to go berserk when you say divide by zero. And I used to see what happens to the calculator. And, and these days modern calculators will say ERR. Those days, it, you know, the calculator will get jumbled up, doesn't know what to do. So, nasti akritaha kritena. That which is uncreated cannot be created by an action, by karma. So then what should that person do? Sa guru meva bhigachet. That person may he or she go to a teacher, go to a guru. Sa guru meva bhigachet. What kind of guru also 
the shastram this particular upanishad talks about shrotriyam brahmanishtham qualifies that word guru by saying shrotriyam brahmanishtham one who is knowledgeable in the shastras shrotriyam shrotriya brahmanishtha one who is who was completely assimilated that shastram one who is steadfast in the knowledge of brahman brahmanishtha one who knows clearly that i am brahman and the whole world is brahman there is nothing in this world but brahman everything is a manifestation of brahman so that's a little meaning of the word brahmanishtha and so one who recognizes that one one student who has recognized the limitations of karma should approach that guru who is a shrotriya and a brahmanishtha so that is it is said in the upanishads and it will also come in the bhagavad gita and any any text you take written by ali shankara acharya or ramana maharshi or anybody else you will find them referring to referring to a teacher in fact they will start the verse we're going to start tattva bodha shortly in case you are wondering what happened has jay kumar ji forgotten that he was going to teach tattva bodha no i have not forgotten it's coming and tattva bodha the author of tattva bodha starts with a verse in praise of his own guru so we can see that in every text almost every text you will see that the author praises the his or her teacher <clears throat> so now the the question is asked how do i identify a person who looks at this problem as a fundamental as a, one of born of error i can't look into the mind of a person so then it is exactly like asking the question how do you know your 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 children have grown up and they are now in 12th grade and they are graduating and you have to send them to college and they are doing well and you want to send them to a good college how do you know which college to send them to how do you know every college says they are good if you go to their website so you can't simply toss a coin and say okay a b c or d you can't do that no no more parent does that so again what's being what's out there people know what are these top notch universities what's good about a university a particular university what's not so good what to watch out for why a particular university is good which department is good in which university all these ideas people have so you collect that data and then only embark on this journey to find a university same thing here also finding a guru also is somewhat like that you have to one 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 knows who are some of the good uh, some of the respected acharyas of our times it is there people know it one has to ask one has to find out and somebody else in the class pointed out that uh, that if the student is ready i think vakateshan ji pointed out once if the student is ready then the teacher will appear so that's a that's a way of stating it yes that is so true also and uh, so we don't know how it works we really don't know how it works i will say that lot of punyam is needed to get a right person because i did not look for a teacher i did not say no no i analyzed all this 
and now I am looking for a person. Who is that person? I want the best person to teach me. No, I didn't think like this. And so things happen sometimes. And so we, we are always uh, prayerful. And those prayers uh, do the job here also. So I will stop with that today. It's about 7 o'clock here in India. So we covered, the topics we covered today are <clears throat> understanding the word Bhagavad Gita itself, what it means, continuing on the topic of the word Bhagavan, then the contents of the Bhagavad Gita, Karma Yoga and Jnana Yoga, the major contents, major categories of the topics. And we talked about the need for a guru. What is a guru and why a guru, a teacher is needed to unfold this subject matter. And the peculiarity, because of the peculiarity of the subject matter. And quote unquote, how do you choose a guru? Briefly, we touched upon that. So we'll stop with that and uh, I'll open up uh, the class for any questions. Yeah, so Panduji, you want to ask your question? That way everybody can hear you. Oh yeah, Panduji actually what he did is he, he sent us that statement of Albert Einstein. Problems cannot be solved with the same mindset that created them. Yeah, thank you. Okay. Yeah, so Ravi, uh, Ravi Janakji is asking, Miraj, Miraj, is Miraj connected to Mithya, the word Mithya? So possible, possible. We need to do some research. See, this is where we need to support our, our Indian scholars, Sanskrit scholars to do these kinds of research. And uh, we do know one thing, mythology, the word myth itself, the word myth, M-Y-T-H. I'm fairly certain that word myth comes from the word mythya. And, uh, but they have called our Puranas and Ramayana as mythology. That I disagree. Our Purana and myth and Ramayana, we don't consider this as mythology at all. Ramayana is a real story. Who are you to call it mythology? Who are you to label it as a myth? Hey, we say Rama lived in this country. He walked in this country. So, and he went to Sri Lanka. We, this is real for us. We, we, we have traced the steps of Rama and Sita and Lakshmana. So, this is not a myth. So, yeah, some words like myth and all are uh, derived from mythya, I think. Yeah. Okay. Any other uh, questions? Okay, good. So, uh, <clears throat> we will stop with that. And uh, what we can do is, uh, we have Surindra Vat Vatveji. Surindra ji, ha, have we uh, uh, have we heard your introduction before? I uh, no no. Uh, okay, if you don't mind, if you don't mind, see one of the things we did in our class is we introduced each other, and uh, so if you could please uh, uh, introduce yourself. Yeah, actually, the, I'm based in Pune. I'm a mechanical engineer. I, I had worked both in India and uh, outside India. Now uh, settled in Pune. Basically, I started with uh, Bhagavad Gita uh, uh, learning. Uh, I first did the pronunciation part of it. Then I attended a class by Swami Parthasarthi on Bhagavad Gita. And then that has given me a lot of inspiration. I have also done uh, this uh, uh, Ramdas Swami's uh, literature study. That is my brief introduction. Yeah, yeah. Thank you, thank you. So you are you are in Pune, you said, right? 
Yes, that is right. Yes. Okay. And I have a question to you about today's uh, topic. Sure. <clears throat> yeah, you mentioned that uh, Shiva has a role of uh, teacher, Dakshinamurti, and Saraswati as presiding deity. So, what is the exact relationship there now? Uh, you mean to say that Saraswati is one step above, or what? Yeah. So, <clears throat> so no, uh, we don't talk about being above or below. Uh, see, so in our shastram, in our culture, because everything is Ishvara, everything is Bhagavan. Yes. So then we have the we have the freedom to attribute a presiding deity to everything in this world. Okay. So we say water is needed for our survival. Yeah. So water devata. We will create a water devata and call him Varuna. Yes. Vayu devata. Vayu is important for us, is it not? Yes. Yes. Vayu devata. Hmm. Worship Vayu devata so that your air is not polluted. Okay. So this is how we we uh, this is how our culture is. And so Saraswati. Saras means knowledge. Saras means knowledge. And. Uh, one who has knowledge, one who is an embodiment of knowledge. Remember when we explained Bhagavan, what did we say? Balavan, Gunavan, etc. Like that Bhagavan. So Bhagavan means what? One who has Bhaga is Bhagavan. One who has Bala is Balavan. One who has Saras must be Saraswan. And one, the lady who has Saras should be Saraswati, like Gunavati, Balavati, Bhagavati. Okay, understood. Yeah, thanks. Thank you. So we don't we don't necessarily compare the Dakshinamurti and Saraswati. Right. They're all they're all there to bless us any way we want. Absolutely, yes. Okay. So if there are uh, no other questions, uh, Venkateshan Ji is asking. Uh, okay, the question is, does Guru Dakshinamurti, is, is he different from Jupiter? Is he different from Jupiter? Means planet Jupiter, I think that's what you mean. Okay. So let's, uh, let's tackle this problem. Again, same thing. So, Ishta Deva, see, let's say Surya Devata is there. Aditya, everybody does uh, Surya Namaskara. Many people do Surya Namaskara every day. Om Sham Nitra Yanamaha. Om Hrim Ravaye Yanamaha. Om Hrum Surya Yanamaha. Like this, there are 12 names. And each time you chant, you have to do one Surya Namaskara. One sequence of 10 or 12 steps, right? 10 steps. So each time you are you are you are praising Surya Devata with a different name, Aditya, Hiranyagarbha, etc. So who are you worshipping? There is the physical sun out there which I can see with my eyes. That sun seems to be rising and setting. That's the physical aspect. The this the Everything that's needed for the sun, all the knowledge that is there, which is manifest as this sun. The physicists are saying the sun is a, is a burning mass where some reactions are occurring. Hydrogen, helium, whatever, what all happens there, some combustion has to happen. Temperature must be so much 6000 degrees centigrade or something I seem to have read long ago. So they give all these data about sun. What the physicists are doing is inquiring into the mind of the so-called body of knowledge, which we call the sun, which we look at as the sun. And that body of knowledge is called Surya Devata. That if you personify the sun, then the sun becomes a Devata for us. 
every law remember every law is ishwara for us for us any operating law that you recognize or you don't recognize is attributed is ishwara direct pratyaksha so that's why hindus can never say i don't see god we can never say that because i see god everywhere this is god for me because this is ishwara because there is a law there are so many laws that are operating to make this function and that law is ishwara and so i see ishwara right in front of me so i was sitting right next to a in a in a flight and i it he knocked on my he tapped on my shoulder and said that he said where is god i said what we haven't even exchanged one word i don't know who he is he is he is a no he doesn't know who i am and uh, as he he must have asked do you believe in god or something i don't know and then i found out this guy is a muslim and he asked me this question is god there in this i looked at him and said my dear friend absolutely this is ishwara for us who are you tell me about yourself because i am not going to open my mouth until i know who i am talking to so we had a little exchange there so look at the orientation and he tried to tell me oh this won't work for you man this is what he was trying to tell me i told him we will figure it out ourselves we don't need you to help us and it's because he was getting a little belligerent so so look at the orientation there so whenever i look at this pen and say i think of that somehow that that past experience comes to me but yeah so this is ishvara this is devata so for us jupiter jupiter because it is the see another another uh, fact guru the word guru in sanskrit also means heavy also means heavy okay keep that fact in mind so guru means teacher guru means heavy and guru has an influence big influence in our lives and our our ancestors were masters of astronomy and they have figured out all the these forces that are playing out there in the solar system without the use of any telescopes without the use of any instruments i don't know how they did all this and they figured out there is a big planet and we are going to call him guru because this planet has a lot of influence on all other planets including earth so he became guru for us and uh, so so yes there is a connection if you want to call it and uh, that guru guru bhagavan guru devata is also attributed to the planet jupiter for these reasons good question we need to get a, get into the bottom of a lot of questions like this yeah so prasad ji is asking a question prasad you can unmute yourself and ask also yeah go ahead prasad i will unmute i'll unmute you yeah right i am muted uh, so you you are just mentioning about showing the pen and saying uh, god is there everywhere so that is referring to basically the uh, existence if i understand that way that is correct yeah so can we say that the pen as earlier when you are talking about something you refer to a uh, being also so now i'm linking these two can pen be called as being i mean can yeah, be referred, pen be. referred as being sorry yeah so see that's the beauty of of our uh, our shastram is first question 
if we paint God as somebody who is out there, then this discussion will not arise at all because God is not here. God is somewhere else. And you can at best say God created this pen. At best you can say that. And walk away. No other explanation can be given. But when we say Ishvara is all pervasive, we have to be referring to existence. That existence, when you say I exist, that existence is all pervasive. That existence cannot be negated. That existence cannot die. That existence cannot be removed. Like this pen. The pen may be removed. The pen may be destroyed. Because the pen is only a form. A form of what if you say? The pen is a form of plastic. To start out with we can say that. Form of plastic. But then we will ask the question. Plastic is what? Plastic is but a form of polyethylene molecules. Polyethylene. Ethylene ko laker, polymerize karo, then it becomes a chain of ethylene. And that chain is appearing to me as something which I call plastic. So if you ask a chemist what this is, that fellow will say, this is just carbon and hydrogen and Maybe oxygen also in this. That's all he will say. He says this is nothing but carbon, hydrogen and oxygen. So, pen is but a form of carbon, hydrogen and oxygen. But even that chemist has to accept the fact that carbon, hydrogen and oxygen also are only forms of something. Forms of what? If somebody asks, you have to go down further. Then the physicist steps in and he says, yeah, I know what that is. Then he or she talks about protons and neutrons and electrons. Those days in school, that's what I learned as the fundamental particles. These days, you know, 40 years later, science has gone a long way and they talk about many other particles, positrons, etc. and now quarks. And uh, they talk about strings and things like that. So the search is still going on. So just remember, the search is still going on. So nobody, suppose you say the quark is the most fundamental part, particle ever discovered by the, by the human being. Okay, good. Stay with the quark. But even that, even the inventor of quark will agree that quark is not the fundamental particle. There is something more, we don't know what it is. That's all he will say. He will accept that. Okay. So, that fundamental thing, our rishis have said, it is existence. Being. So, it's a big topic. That is the topic of Vedanta. So, yeah, to answer your question, Prasad, yes. When you say pen is... That is, is what sustains the pen. And that is, is Ishvara. Jake Mar, so you mentioned yeah. the concept of Guru, right? So are you, should somebody have one person or one entity dedicated as Guru for him to find the path? Or is it more of a concept that we are looking at? Like, I mean, you may have multiple, you, multiple people or multiple things that act as a guru at a given point. Is it something like this? Or are you trying to say that it has to be a one-on-one -on -one relationship between two individuals that has to sustain the, I mean, sustain through times and whatnot? Yeah, so it is, uh, see, generally, Generally, one individual can have a big impact in one's life. So then they, we say that person is our guru. That person is my guru. Like that we say. But our relationship 
is not limited to that one person and uh, one can have any number of teachers our uh, our swami dayananda ji used to say he had three gurus one is swami chinmayananda who 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 taught him about vedanta that there is something called vedanta then swami pranavananda ji who when swami ji went to went to gudivada in andhra pradesh swami pranavananda ji asked him to give a talk and when swami ji spoke about something pranavananda ji stopped him and said wait that's not right and pranavananda ji taught him what is pramanam what is pramanam because pramanam is such an important topic to appreciate so he says from pranavananda ji is my guru then he talks about swami uh, what is that uh, yeah i forget the name of this guruji uh, from 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 rishikesh and uh, so he was my guru because from him i learned the brahma sutras i learned the shankara bhashyam of the brahma sutras brahma sutra is not easy to teach and so he considers him as a guru so like this mary any one can have any number of teachers so we don't have any such these kinds of rules are not there in 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 sanatana dharma and uh, the idea is that somebody is needed to unlock the you know needed to unfold needed to show the way and that's about it and there are no expectations from a, from a guru either a real guru if you say who is that that person cannot be expecting something from the student that he will be with me he will continue to be my student for a long time all these ideas are all funny ideas if the guru has that kind of expectation then that guru is insecure see let's think about the consequences of these kinds of thinking if a person is desperate for students then that person cannot be a guru because uh, the guru needs students in order to feel secure feel happy about himself or herself so the consequences are way too many if you get into this discussion so so a simple answer to your question is no there is uh, nothing that uh, limits one's relationship to other teachers yeah hari prasad yeah mary if you have any further questions you can ask later yeah jay kumar but you yeah hari prasad go ahead you are unmuted yeah usually the term guru is reserved for the person who gives the diksha he is the he is the real guru for that person am i right yeah good, good point uh, arpasad ji is bringing good point and uh, so maybe i should uh, <clears throat> mention that uh, there is another definition for the word guru the, the technical definition of the word guru is mahavakya upadeshakarta mahavakya upadeshakarta so the one who gives the teaching of the mahavakya is a guru that is the that is the formal formal definition of the word guru so that's what harpasad is saying hey the one who gives gives that upadesha the one who one who is playing a central role in in communicating that important fact that person gets the status of the guru in one's life okay just to continue what i just asked so i mean i come from a whole different background that's why i ask you these questions so you have you you get you think somebody is a good a guru he knows it all and you're following and uh, it's been good but then suddenly 
I mean, so knowing that the guru is just a mere mortal, he, he, you find something that is not agreeable to you anymore, or you find this fundamentally something wrong going on. Whatever he taught you thus far, will that be null and void? Or are you going to say, you know what? Um, okay, he has taught me many good things, so let them stay with me. And from now on, or do you continue with whatever, assuming that because of his teachings, you learn certain things and you set certain things in practice. Do you undo those things or you go with those? Yeah. So, <clears throat> see, we don't have the problem as much here because uh, in our, in our, uh, in all, of, all the talks we attend, and when we stay in the ashram and study this course and so forth, we spend a lot of time asking the teacher questions. In fact, if I if you if you if you if I have to measure the amount of time I spent listening, sitting in classes listening, and amount of time spent in satsang asking questions, they are almost comparable. So for every hour of class, we must have spent at least 15-20 minutes asking questions about that topic. So, this, this topic is something which has to be understood. And so, if something is against my logic, if something is against my reasoning, it will most likely be against other people's reasoning also. And so, and so then that becomes a topic of contention. In our, in our relationship. So we will ask Guruji, you said A, B, and then you said C, but C doesn't follow from A and B. This is, this is a difficult question. So it's typically like a student-teacher relationship in a school or a college. No teacher in a school or no college teacher, uh, professor will say, you believe everything I say. Nobody will say that. Nobody. I have not heard anybody say that. They can say, did you understand, is what the teacher will finally ask. Did you understand what I said? And half the students can cross their head and say, no, I didn't understand. That's possible. But nobody will say, F is equal to MA because I said it. You must believe it. No, such teacher doesn't exist. Same thing here, Mary, since this is a topic of understanding. Wherever things are needed to be proved, we rely on proofs only. Wherever things have to be believed, we let go with the beliefs. But we don't accept things that cannot be believed. We don't accept things that cannot be believed. He eternal heaven. Heaven, for example, Cannot be proved, cannot be disproved, so it must be believed. And we are okay believing it. The fundamental message of Vedanta is unaffected by my belief or disbelief of heaven, Swarga. Okay? Okay, number one. Next, heaven can be believed. What about eternal heaven? Right away, eternal heaven is disproved. Because heaven being finite, if you say heaven does not include earth, heaven is a place somewhere else if you say, then heaven is a finite object. And if you say I am going to go to that heaven, okay, that I may be able to believe. But if you say I am going to be there eternally, then Vedanta will rubbish it right away. Vedanta 101. Eternal heaven is not possible because anything finite, anything, any place that you go to, you have to come out of that place. The place itself will disappear after some time. The place itself is changing in time. And my entry, if you say entry, you have to talk about exit. These are all, these are all like two sides of the coin. And so Vedanta just rubbishes all these ideas right away. So therefore, Vedanta allows us to, it gives us a platform, very, very solid platform from which we can stand and and, uh, and it empowers us to ask questions. No Vedanta teacher will, will say, 
how can you ask such a question who are you to ask me this kinds of thinking they, they, i have not seen it in vedanta it doesn't exist because i can point to somebody and say hey that do you see why that question is wrong do you see why that question is flawed somebody asked the question are you following a fool or are you leading are you walking in front of a fool suppose somebody asked this question how will you answer it are you walking behind a fool or are you walking in front of a fool we have to be careful before answering this question right because if you if i say i am i am walking in front of a fool that means i must be a bigger fool if i am walking behind a fool then then also i am a fool so we have to we have to be careful you have to say hey it's a wrong question or i am not going to answer that question don't fall in that trap so some some questions are like this and we have to we have to just be careful uh careful about these things so so mary i think that's i know coming from where you are coming from i think uh, i can understand that question and this fear of hell and uh, this sin you know god will punish you if you ask these questions god will punish you if you if you threaten somebody or if you don't go by the by the book this you know we don't we are we are not uh, we are not encumbered by these kinds of uh, ideas mary does that help yeah yeah thank you thank you a yeah, good question uh, mary has a christian background so that's why she is asking the question so based on what uh, uh, mary has asked just now uh, i got a different question in my mind uh, the knowledge is uh, real in the sense that once it is considered as knowledge it is real i mean it cannot be different i mean it cannot be a myth now a guru who has been uh, teaching the knowledge uh let's that it find out that the guru himself is not following the virtues of that knowledge now at this point whether i consider it as knowledge which is to be followed or it doesn't it is not valid at all well the shastra says that it is knowledge which is real because knowledge cannot be different once it is considered as a knowledge but uh, when it comes to guru when a guru says something which i need to follow because that is knowledge but if it is uh, we come to know that guru himself is not following that no- the knowledge aspects can i still take it as a knowledge to be followed uh, uh, am i clear uh, i'm going yeah. so See, that's exactly was my question too what if the guru being a mortal fails does whatever he taught you so far uh, can i can i just take his knowl what he told me was knowledge as knowledge or should i have to i mean yeah does it become null and void at this point whatever he taught you you're not bound by that anymore yeah so so by definition knowledge is something that cannot be negated knowledge is something that each individual can validate so so that's the beauty of knowledge so it is up to each of us to gain that knowledge and validate the knowledge now yes a a person who teaches this subject cannot be adharmic for example cannot be given to cheating lying manipulating not possible because dharma itself is a prerequisite for this for this vedanta and so if a person is doing that i would say that is doing a disservice to the shastram and forget vedanta this this adharma itself why would we even relate to a person who is adharmic 
so so yes that conflict arises it can arise yes it can arise it has arisen i've seen people i've seen friends gone through, who have gone through that process and so sometimes then a tough decision has to be made by by the student who is learning by the devotee tough decision may have to be made to walk away from the system so all this is there yes so when that happens we don't question the knowledge we accept that the human being has limitations and this person has become a victim of those limitations so that's the thing so we don't question the question the shastram there shastram is there open for anybody so many people have taught and gone and we have seen so much about and heard so much about them so i don't have any reason to question the shastram so when something like this happens then we can say then this is an aberration this particular so called guru uh is abusing the system has not got it is is straying away from the path and this is this is not right yes i met somebody like that i met a, met a swami ji and uh, he was uh, he was uh, he was ga- ga- chatting with a lot of students who had come to learn from another teacher and he was uh, he was having some very very crass conversations and uh, so i used to walk away from there and then at one point uh, he was he told me oh you are a serious student you won't come to conversations like this he said then i got i said i have to say something i told him swami ji people have come here to study everybody here has come to study not to chat all day long and actually what you are doing is wrong if this continues further i will report this to swami ji this is what i told that swami ji so we have to be alert every system can be subject to abuse no system as i said the other day no system is self protecting only the people who follow the system have to protect the system so we need to be alert to these kinds of things yes good question okay so we will stop with that and it's about 7:35 now let's stop with the prayer <clears throat> Om Swasti Prajapyaf Paripala Yanta Nyaye Namarge Namahi Mahisha Gopram Nepyaf Shudhamastu Nityam Loka Samasta Sukhino Bhavantu Kale Varshatu Parjanya Prithvi Sasya Shalini Desho Yam शोभरहिता ब्राह्मण संत निर्भया ओम सर्वे भवन्तु सुखिनः सर्वे संत निरामया सर्वे भद्राणि पश्यन्तु मा कश्चित दुख भाग भवेत असतो मा सद्गमय तमसो मा ज्योतिर्गमय मृत्यो मा अमृतंगमय ओम पूर्णमदूर्णमद पूर्णा पूर्ण मुदक्ष्य पूर्णश्य पूर्णमादा पूर्णमेवशिष्य ओं शाति 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 हरि ओं श्रीगुरभ्यो नम हरि ओं Today was audio reasonable. Yes. Yeah. Good. Good. Thank you. So, Surendra ji, you are able to uh, hear. Uh, I think we heard you quite well. So, you are able to hear today. Yeah, absolutely good. So, what happened last uh, couple of weeks? Uh, you had difficulty joining. Yeah. 
Yeah, there was some difficulty. I do not know. 